back to some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show. My name is Chris Spangle. It is great to have you here with us talking history. Friday is history day here on the Chris Spangle Show. And we're very excited to have Bruce Carlson from My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. Great podcast that Reinhold and I listen to. I am a patron of it. Uh, so we wanted to give uh, he, some little exposure and then also get you listening to his podcast, but also talk about the Saigon references between Afghanistan and this. So without further ado, please stay tuned right after these words. Warning. This show is for adults by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh. Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show. Our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. If you struggle to understand politics, we explain it from an independent libertarian point of view. With all of the irreverence it deserves, we toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, Chris Spangle, a 15-year veteran of politics and media. Thank you for joining us here on the program today. It is great to be with you, and we have a special treat for you all uh, as we start to uh, dive into more history content. Bruce Carlson, who does the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics podcast over at, uh, I think, Bruce, you just type that into your web address, right? Or you can search for it in any podcast app. Is it MyHistoryCanBeatUpYourPolitics.com, which is very long. It's going to be the only one that's going to come up on most okay. searches. Well, and then we've also got Harry and Ryan Hold is smiling like a three-year-old girl who just got a <laughs> lollipop because he loves this <laughs> podcast and is always talking about it. Um, I think I was the one who recommended I'm a big history fan and I've listened to your podcast for many years. Uh, so it's great to have you here. Can you tell us a little bit about the show and what do you do there? Sure. Thanks so much, Chris and, and Ryan Hall and Harry. It's great, great to be on here. Uh, and thanks for listening. My history can beat up your politics is just that we take history and use it to bring context to today's politics. And now we've been doing it. It is 15 years as of July. So I was podcasting when, you know, the, 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 you, you would say, there's my iPod. It looks like that you know, <laughs> kind of thing. And I actually do well, was, miss those iPods. <laughs> it was funny because I was listening to your podcast yesterday, the one about Saigon that we're probably going to talk a little bit about here. But you replayed some uh, audio from 20, 2006 in there. Uh, and and yeah. something you had done at the time, and you had to apologize for the mic quality <laughs> before you played it. It was, uh, yeah, it was one of these where it was like that would pick up anything in the room, anything, <laughs> including like dust moving through the air. It was a ten dollar Radio Shack, and uh, I used to have to download the uh, upload the episodes, I should say, overnight while I was sleeping because it would take about three hours on a phone line. I mean, it sounds like the eighteen hundreds, but we're talking about you know, 2006, but that's where we were with podcasting, you know, <laughs> uh, great stuff though. So good to, so good to be on and yeah, happy to talk about, uh, Saigon and, uh, and, and, and Kabul and all. Yeah. I mean, your podcast, I think you know, we do, we have a similar podcast on the network that I host called the history of modern politics. It's, it's a fundamentally different show in that we're doing like a full scale, review of history and like where does politics kind of pop up what are some parallels mm -hmm. we can find um you you do a lot more you know random stuff you do some series mm -hmm. you know what are what are some topics that you've enjoyed covering like if people are going to go back and look at your catalog where should they start yeah we've got almost we're getting close to 400 in the archive i'm pretty sure i've done more podcasts than that but they're not all you know not all there or not all exist anymore um we did a whole series on uh, President Reagan and really Ronald Reagan his whole life and talking about every aspect called the dozen Ronald Reagans, which looks at him from 12 different points of view, um, 12 different characteristics and descriptions you could make of Reagan because only because I think he's a polarizing figure, right? So it's a great way to look at people's different politics. You have um, a very few cases where Reagan was to the left of some of the, the, the politics at the time and had to push something that uh, liberals might be proud of today. Not too many times, but a few. Uh, in California, he was uh, came out 
in in the in the mid seventies um, or the late seventies came out against an amendment that would have banned um, gay men and women from becoming teachers in the state of California, <laughs> and Ronald Reagan's um, opposition was crucial to ending that um, that amendment. And, got a lot of trouble with the right for that. So we looked at things like that. And of course, we look at all the different tax policies and defunding school student loans and and some of the way that he ran for president and all of those issues. But in 12 issues, you can in, you know, episodes, you can do an awful an awful lot. Uh, We've also uh, recently done one called the Ark of Commerce, which talks Mm -hmm. about and that name comes from as a double play on the fact that arcs, these kind of wooden rafts, were first used to transport flour from the breadbasket of the nation in kind of mid to western Pennsylvania down to new markets in Baltimore and to get around the Philadelphia merchants that were really choking them and charging high prices. And that's just one of many commerce stories that we told in the um, in the course of telling the history of American commerce. And we go through the sea commerce, we go through land commerce, we go through when governments stop commerce as they did during World War I, during the Wilson administration and the suspension of railroad activity and really the control of the railroad completely by the United States now government. Now you're talking our language, Wilson, anti-Wilson, yeah. Yeah. anti-government yeah. propaganda. Um, <laughs> yeah. well, like what are, when, when you, uh, and I have no idea what your political affiliation is, which is one thing that I really like about the show is that you don't, uh, I don't know if you're a Democrat or Republican. I, I have my suspicions, but I don't, I don't think you, you don't, it's not biased, right? Like you're not, like well, I we think, are, you know, uh, it, it's a great, I'm glad you, I'm glad you're asking that because I think it's a great point to make. I don't understand why people can't be objective, like when they have a political position. It seems like they they um, probably in their own head are working all kinds of things out. And when they go out in the world, it's just one one. They have to phrase, you know, they have to uh, phrase everything in in one position as if they're like a talking spin monster. Maybe it's maybe it's George Stepanopoulos who had us all talking like spin since the 90s or something. I, I, I'm, I'm pretty upfront on my show that I lean a little bit more left on things. I'm also, uh, you know, I would say I'm kind of particularly on social issues, um, libertarian on some things and some economic issues, particularly when you're talking about like small businesses and making things easier, libertarian on some things. Um, I could be considered conservative by some people who are very left of me, you know, and things like that. But when we talk about politics and history, particularly when we talk about the history, we got to you know, we got to be grownups and we got to shed some of that. You know, um, there's a time for persuasion talk and there's a time for analysis. And that's what I try to do. And um, it's not always easy. It's like working muscles. You know, you got to make sure you get a rounded view of things. Like usually it's kind of like, well, I'm about to say this, but wait, what's the other side? What would someone come at me with? And then go and try to find some information and see what that point of view is you know i wish i could think of a good example in the uh in the topic that we're going to talk about today and i think that good example would be you know um nixon gets a really bad rap but is nixon all bad you know i mean were his actions that he take took for instance in reaching out to china extraordinary probably impossible for another president to pull off and really did lead to the um to the end of uh, the Vietnam War. So you got to look at certain things and not just be, you know, not just uh, take a whole position and uh, just stick with one way, you know. And uh, looking at history tends to wear down too much, too, about how, you know, ideology, like how much you're really going to be, you know, yeah, I I kind of The more I study history, the less, I I don't want to say ideological, uh, less I care about the the left-right, politics of whatever's on cnn that day. like you you are less concerned about some things and you're more concerned about other things than a lot of other people seem to be um i mean as so i'm gonna ask one more question then reinhold gets a fangirl mm-hmm. question then we're gonna go to sure. uh, afghanistan <laughs> afghanistan but or saigon excuse me um what when you thought about politics before this podcast or you know what 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 has your how has your view changed and how do you think like Dan Carlin's uh, political podcast Common Sense you listen to him 
And mm. I, I, a lot of what he says rings true to me because I'm more into history than I am politics these days. Mm. Uh, and you end up coming out with a weird skewed view because you understand the past. Why do you think that is? Why is it important to understand the past? And how do you think we ought to apply that? The past, it re repeats itself, or as uh, Mark Twain has been misquoted, it often rhymes. It, it is similar, and similar things happen all the time. You know, it hasn't changed the human history. You know, biologists can tell us this thing is about the, the same. Right. The the technologies change. We have automobiles and instead of horses, we have bicycles instead of horses and things like that. But we the the mind is is we're similar material up there. You think that some certain political things like, um, um, you know, trying to run for president with the hope of becoming maybe selected for vice president never happened before, you know, just, uh, the, you know, political spin never happened before, um, befriending reporters, uh, starting your own newspaper that would be, uh, more aligned to your views. I mean, that's something that as soon as Zachary Taylor became president, they said, okay, Here's what you got to do. You got to have you got to pick one of these newspapers. Probably the Washington Union is going to be your one. And that's going to be your newspaper that you're going to give the uh, the stories to. So, you know, these things happen over and over. So that's the first thing that you know that it, it takes some of the fire out of uh, political debates when you know that things have happened before. It doesn't mean exactly before. There's no doubt when someone like Donald Trump ran for president, for instance, I mean, that's a very different thing. And the way he conducted himself in the office, those were very different things. It's not to say new things won't happen in history, but look at what happened, the result that political prognosticators could have predicted, which is he didn't win re-election. So you tried a bunch of different things and that and that action set didn't get you that re-election. So you can be crazy, you can do different things. Nixon, like very um, very much to this conversation, one of the things Nixon told Kissinger is I'm going to be the madman. You let them know I'm crazy. I could do anything. I'll press this button tomorrow. You just let them know that. Let the Chinese know that. Let the North Vietnamese know that. That worked for 30 days or so. You know, it was a nice new political trick and it doesn't. So look, these things repeat over time. A certain way presidents and congresses and foreign policy works. You don't get as excited. You also know that policies are going to work and then they're going to have side effects so I'm someone who would like people to get health care. You know, how we do it is debatable. And I'm not so ideological anymore about like the how we do it on a lot of things because you're looking in the past of history and seeing certain things that worked well and certain things that had additional problems down the line. Right. Um, so that's why I think it's really it's really important to to look at the history. And I don't spend a lot of time. Um, on uh, on on what it's particularly what like the columnist said this week. Just, there, there was somebody yeah. that I forget. I mean, I forget who it was, but they said that oh, it was Ryan Holiday, who's an author. Uh -huh. He said I've just stopped watching the news and I just read history books that are related to the news, and I learn way more about how people react than anything else. Like reading the book about the 1918 flu by John Barry. Yes at the beginning of this pandemic was fascinating because we've done everything that they did with the same everything. people, no different. Right. Yeah, San Francisco ahead. and the anti-maskers. <laughs> exactly. I mean. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you did it. You did a, a show on that too. And on, on the, uh, the pandemic. And it was, that was a very good one too. Um, I guess my question is that uh, what I really love about your, your podcast is that when you're telling these stories and you're talking about the history, you, you do it, you do it with stories. Right. You, you mm -hmm. tell a lot of like personal stories that happened during the time and more from a, a, a point of view than just basic, you know, here's the numbers, here's the facts, here's what happened, more academic base. And I think that really draws you into the to the mindset so that you can understand better on what's going on. Was that was that a conscious decision when you first started or was that something that kind of developed over the, the 15 years that you've been doing the show? I think it's instinct. I think it's a lot of the show writes itself still to this day. I probably have a little more strategy than I used to and uh, try to find things in the research phase that will be interesting to talk about. What's the what's the strangest thing? And 
And, you know, I always find it because I think life is funny. Life is interesting. You could talk to your friends and have a bunch of stories about what happened to you. And they're different than someone just reporting on what a uh, what a weekend should be like, an average weekend in America. And in history, it's the same. There's these crazy things that go on. Like in the case of the Saigon, that was the first thing I pick up on. Like, whoa, that the secret code was when they needed to get out, they were going to play Bing Crosby's White Christmas. And, you know, it's not unusual either. There's usually... This life and history's just recorded life, and it's our job, uh, those of us who do it, to record, to um, do the playback, I guess, of the recording, to put it together well, to give you the best sense of what it was like at the time and what the attitudes were like at the time. The other way you're describing has never been much of my thought, although I might get into it in minute 30 or something like that, where you do that textbook way of things, which is like, by the way, even the textbook authors, if you start, or your history authors anymore, a lot of them are journalists. A lot of them are telling stories, too, because this is the way people relate. I, I just don't think there's an there's another way to do it than to I mean, you don't always have to say, here's what, you, you know, you are in a room and it's dark and this is what living in a tenement might be. You can do some of that. It might get um, too much after a while. But you do have to tell the story of what it was like for that person or for those people during it yeah not just talking about um yeah i mean so much of that that general stuff where it's like the 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 um and then the cold war began and uh the united states and the usr were pitted against each other and there was a the, the, you know a, a ton 10 to 15 year struggle while both sides mobilized and they had this many forces and the other side had that many forces yeah it's it's not um, useful. It's not real. Um, and the other, and the other thing to always think about is there's stuff going on now, and there's stories being created. You know, there's things going on in the Biden White House probably that we'll hear about later. And you know, that's all we're that's all we're trying to do on the show. Well, you mentioned something too about always trying to find something unique or, or interesting about the story, and that's. One thing I've always come away with when I when I listen to a show, there's always something in there. I'm like, I didn't know that, or I hadn't heard that, and I'll go look it up because I'm fascinated mm -hmm. at that point. You know, you, you get me to you get me wanting to learn more about those topics. Um, and I'm I did a, a learner too. I don't I don't know a lot about topics. I mean, now I've done it for 15 years, so right, like anything, you pick things up, right? You remember things, mm -hmm. but I have to say that I'm learning too. I don't I don't know a lot. You know, I do know about certain topics, but when I do that research round and when you do it, you got to kind of do it fully before committing to I'm going to write this down and start writing the script. You got and that's how you get objective, too, because you got to start pulling in other information like, well, that's interesting. But what would my what would my conservative listeners say about that? Yeah, All I, right. I try to do that a lot, too, where you you come up with a position, but then you have to go what would the opposition to this position be and go look and mm -hmm. see what they say yeah. about it. And, and, re, and you have to research that and then combine it. And that's when you get to a more well-rounded opinion on things. I think so. So when we come back, we're going to jump into, oh, excuse me, sorry. You know, sometimes you pull that trigger too soon. Well, we're going to talk about Saigon and the parallels of Afghanistan and get into the story. So stay tuned right after these messages. Welcome to the Chris Spangles Show. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining us here on the We Are Libertarians Podcast Network. And we've got Bruce Carlson from My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. Make sure you check it out in your podcast feed. And everywhere, everybody is talking about the Saigon moment. And I don't think a lot of people actually know what Saigon is. So let's jump back into history and talk about the end of Vietnam. And let's see what lessons we might be able to learn from that. So, Bruce, like, help us set the scene for the Saigon moment. I was surprised when I was researching this mm. that we had been out of active military fighting for like two years at that point when Saigon fell. That's right. Uh, defensive operations stopped in January of 1973. The reality is Nixon's entire first term, he's pulling troops out. Mm. He pulls a lot of troops out. It's almost 100,000 out by the first year of his presidency. And Nixon would be seen forever as the great peacemaker if he didn't also 
simultaneously uh, have this uh, strategy of bombing as well. Mm -hmm. Cambodia and expanding to other countries. Yeah, that was the yeah. mystifying part about the Nixon story because he's the guy that got us out, but he yeah. also expanded the war. Welcome to history, right? It's like you know, it's it's that it's that guy that you you and and I don't know, I don't know that he's the the man of the moment or anything like that. I actually believe that Lyndon Johnson was on the verge of a peace deal right towards the end of the election, that North Vietnam was ready because the previous bombing that Johnson had conducted in North Vietnam at that point um, had actually started to have some, some impact and got them to the peace table. And it was South Vietnam. And, and again, to your question, like where is Saigon? I mean, North Vietnam, South Vietnam, Saigon's the capital of of South Vietnam, Hanoi, the capital of North Vietnam at that time. South Vietnam is a country that's created after the French leave. And it's the um, it's, you know, ostensibly democracy. The Americans have a lot of influence over it. But the real story that I don't think even a lot of people knew at the time is that while the Americans had a lot of influence in South Vietnam and the Kennedy actually allowed an operation that changed the government there violently, um, you know, they didn't have total say because in, on several occasions, South Vietnam, you know, stopped peace treaties from happening because they realized, I believe, that they, well, in the in the go round in 68, that was during the election. And we now know that there was some interference by the Nixon campaign that members of the Nixon campaign got to members of the South Vietnam Senate and said, you know, if you do this peace deal, they're going to destroy your country. By the time you get to 72, that's not the, the case anymore. It's just South Vietnam realizing that Nixon's, you know, for lack of a better word, going to sell them out at the peace yeah. table and they don't want to sign. And they're really forced to sign and given some secret promise by Nixon that he'll continue to support them via the air, something that he doesn't have on paper and doesn't have congressional approval for directly. Yeah, that's interesting because that happened in North, in Afghanistan as well. Like, you, you know, mm -hmm. peace summits have been taking place since, you know, for, for almost, well, over a decade. Uh, and the people who run the Afghan government now don't want to, to give this up because then all the money that they're collecting in their Swiss bank accounts get shut off. You know, so when the Doha agreements take place last year, when Trump is trying to negotiate with the Taliban, they're like, the Afghan government's like, we're not going to abide by this. We're not going to do this. We can't, they, they can't, you know, like you're a puppet government. Yes, they can. You know, so it's, mm. it's interesting that parallel. So, you know, the, the North Vietnamese are aligned with the communists, the South Vietnamese aligned with South uh, Vietnam. And there are a lot of parallels in that corruption in the South Vietnamese government. Are there not like it was a fairly mm. corrupt government that we had propped up that, really hurt our credibility with the people of South Vietnam. Yeah, I mean, the United States instituted the the, the, the president and uh, the assassination of the previous president because uh, we weren't, we weren't, you know, didn't look like we could deal with the uh, previous government. I don't think it was a shining democracy, no, by any means. It was pretty obvious what was going on there and obvious to people. And there's a lot more popular support for the communist government north whether they really knew what it was going to be like later or not you know you could argue that but there was more popular support they were gaining more recruits it was easier for them to build an, an army of people whereas for south vietnam they needed american support to even keep it a country and what you really see in the process of the peace negotiation through nixon's first term it's almost like negotiating with yourself or negotiating with your politics. You know, Nixon wants out to achieve a campaign promise, to eliminate a, a, a campaign problem that he's running up against McGovern, who's got, uh, you have the 26th Amendment passed. Nixon thinks it's going to be a good thing for him. He's always supported it, but now he's got an opponent that's got young people riled up, McGovern. And the Vietnam War is, is Nixon's worst issue. He needs to do something. He also made a campaign promise to end the war with honor. Those two last words, with honor, as opposed to any other way of ending the war, in my opinion, led to about four more years of mm. additional casualties 
and uh, probably 20,000 on his side of the Vietnam War. And then basically a war that now lasted through two presidents, um, really four presidents, but two, two presidents during the height of it and two parties. And uh, that whole period, he's trying to get deals. He tries the madman theory where it's like, I might be crazy. He tries bombing the supply lines in Laos and Cambodia because he's seeing that that's how they're getting um, uh, supplies and he wants to deal with it. There's also a memo that we now know of called the Zilch memo, which um, Butterfield, who is the man who revealed the tapes during Watergate, the assistant deputy um, chief of staff under um, uh, Haldeman, revealed that there's this memo where Nixon basically said, you know, the bombing doesn't do anything militarily, but every time I do it, I go up in the polls, particularly in the Republican Party, and particularly with people like Wallace voters that he's concerned about in that side. So we have that memo. We also incidentally have phone calls from Lyndon Johnson of very similar nature, like I'm not winning. We're not winning here. I can go out and whatever you're hearing me go out and say, we're not winning and it, this is impossible. So we have both presidents kind of on the record um, one way or the other that uh, well, even Kennedy in the beginning. I mean, there's um, in the Vietnam Ken Burns documentary. He's like, mm -hmm. this is a, going to be a total waste of time. <laughs> I mean, Kennedy, in the very um, beginning, he says it. Yeah. Oh, well, Kennedy, I believe, uh, even as a senator, uh, cast doubt on even the French situation or whether we should help them and uh have has was always a bit skeptical about the um situation in in vietnam and and whether a large american troop presence would be effective i think at one point he went to vietnam and he said something so along those lines and it was kind of a little controversial when he was mm -hmm. before he was skeptical. president yeah 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 I think so, so let, let's jump forward i mean if you're looking at afghanistan you know we stop operations in 2014 under obama but you you, you mm. still have troops there and and the troops troop deaths which to me are the only metric that matters the the, the one you the number you want is zero mm -hmm. um, which is why we're withdrawing now but it's been you know five 15 20 per year since then but you you have like these the handful of advisors who are kind of uh propping up this army, propping up this government, and withdrawing them just... Now, most people don't understand that the Taliban operated 60% of the country. Uh, when we look back at Vietnam and we're talking about that, that I don't know what you call it, interregnum between the, the stopping of operations and the fall of Saigon, which is just the complete withdrawal, you know, is there... Is it clear? Is it as clear in Vietnam that when we leave that it's just going to be a complete toppling. And absolutely so clear, absolutely okay. clear in my opinion, but also there's evidence in the tapes between Nixon and Kissinger now that have come out later where um, Kissinger basically admits that all they were looking for in this peace process at that point is not a win where there's gonna be a South Vietnam forever. It's a decent interval where it's going to essentially look good that it's not going to collapse the next day. Um, so you have a very similar situation because the resulting agreement that ends the Vietnam War, ends America, America's part in the Vietnam War, you know, really the obligations are all on us. There is a stipulation that there'll be no foreign equipment sent in except for replacements. So that applies to us and the Soviet Union and China that were supplying North Vietnam. Uh, when we were getting pounded, we were getting pounded by Soviet artillery and Soviet planes and things like that. Uh, but the the one who has to withdraw is the United States. So North Vietnamese troops that are in South Vietnam do not have to leave as a result of this agreement. And this is what Nixon and Kissinger sign off on. He, he wants a deal. This is it, There's no other way to look at it. He wants a deal before that election. He, he wanted it, um, I think, even earlier. But they were uh, he was he was, you know, I think some of the bombing was was uh, he thought might be effective. And they were also delaying a bit again at the peace table. And so Kissinger couldn't get get to a peace deal immediately. But right before the election, you know, they were eager to sign and they convinced South Vietnam to go along by just saying that, you know, a, a kind of secret commitment between Nixon and the president of South Vietnam that I will send an air power where needed. The agreement does allow the United States to replace 
So if South Vietnam loses a tank, the United States can replace that tank. But that's really cool comfort to uh, to somebody that has enemy troops in their in their nation. Yeah, one thing that I was surprised by in your episode, and, and Reinhold referenced it, was the amount of plans that were in place. And this is where this is where like Biden gets no pass. You know, there there was, seems to be no plans, and and a lot of that goes on the military too. I mean, they, you know, the military and Trump were never in step. Biden and the military, in some respects, have not been in step on this. They don't want to leave. And so they've just sort of, in my opinion, disobeyed the the commander in chief and not prepared. But, you know, uh, so looking at the fall of Saigon on Wikipedia, you know, on April 3rd, uh, mm. Ford announced Operation Baby Lift and evacuated 2000 orphans. Mm. Um, and then over 25 horses. Orphans were evacuated. Operation New Life resulted in the evacuation of over 110,000 Vietnamese refugees. The final evacuation was Operation Frequent Wind, which resulted in 7,000 people being evacuated. Frequent Wind is the photos of people climbing up the famous stairs that's in the Ford Museum now as they're trying to cling onto helicopters, you know, and some of these these photos uh, are really striking. Um but Operation Wind is what we we all know, and there were multiple plans that were in place. Um, and while you're talking, I'm going to pop up, you know, one of those photos sure. just so people can kind of see the parallels. So please don't be distracted by that. No, uh, no, no. But but I think the parallels between these two, uh, you know, the the parallels are image. They're not planning. That's it. It's very much true. In other words, that look, there's a certain situation where there's going to be a limit to who you can take out. We can't bring the entire nation of South Vietnam and make them United States citizens. They, they, it was, as it was, it was the largest opera almost in the end, when you count the, what the, the operations you mentioned, and then plus the self evacuees who got on uh, ships in the Saigon river and got to Manila, you're, you're talking about almost 140,000 people who a lot of them became United States citizens. And there is a specific, congressional act uh, dedicated to helping them. But yeah, I mean, you see these terrible images and there's people trying to be that additional one getting on the helicopter. And you, you, what you can't um, understand is that, uh, that they, um, wait, what you can't understand is that it, it could be. Um, hey, he's having a little mic trouble here. It sounds like. Um, oh, darn. Yeah, he's, he's, uh, I'll be right back. <laughs> I'm narrating his, his, uh, your wife just popped in, or I assume your wife, excuse me for assuming your status, but sorry about that, uh, podcast today. No, you were right. Uh, we could say broadcast assistant, but why use euphemisms? You know, you know how it is with the, um, uh, you know, everyone's at home these days, still a little bit of that going on, even though we're outside a little. So anyway, oh, my associate um, producer pops in all the time. I totally get it. <laughs> but uh, the main thing you mentioned is you mentioned it was an image. And I think that's so important is that. So when I did the podcast episode on this, what I actually did is um, a podcast episode on the archetype that's been created, which is when the U.S. leaves a place and and how eager people are to say, like, hey, this is Biden's Saigon. You created this image. OK. But have you done the history? Have you investigated the image? And when you look at that operation, it's it's not only wrong, it's kind of an insult to the Marines on the ground to say that it was a failure. That day, uh, April 29th, going into April 30th, not a failure. Biggest helicopter op, uh, evacuation ever. Got 7,000 people. See, it was supposed to be more. It was supposed to be a plane evacuation. And what happened was there is a uh, pilot that defected and bombed the runway. They could not use the airport. The ambassador, Graham Martin, goes to see it with his own eyes. He can't believe it. It's Murphy's Law. <laughs> and they have to now get everybody from the airport where the defense attache office is and get them to the embassy. That embassy where you see a lot of those last images, never supposed to be the spot that the evacuation was going to occur from. That was the backup plan. And um, still... Still, they were able to get almost 7,000, more than 7,000 people between, say, noon of April 29th. And President Ford did a hard stop at three in the morning, April 
30th. And then the last Marines got out at 745 in the morning, April 3rd. Very successful. And fortunately, there were still hundreds of people who we had promised to get out, even under the revised helicopter plan, who were on the embassy grounds. And then a lot more who came over the gates who didn't have that authorization, um, you know, who could, we couldn't get out. So sure, it's a failure and uh, in that way, but overall, it's one of a successful operation. It's just that it became a symbol. You know, when you see those images, it's a symbol of what is a larger failure, the involvement in Vietnam, the attempt to prop up South Vietnam over that period of time. Yeah, there um, was uh, there, yeah. then and Kissinger wanted to go. Uh, people wanted to go back in the administration. I think Ford wanted to go back, and then Kissinger didn't want them to go back in to get more people because it would be mm. personally embarrassing to him. Uh, <laughs> oh, Kissinger! Um, <laughs> but uh, I think it would have been difficult. Any use of force, additionally in Vietnam, you're talking about the last thing, and this hasn't changed, right? The last thing anyone wants to do now, they can they can talk about Biden. You can talk about how bad the evacuation was. You can talk about overall and and we left them we left the taliban in charge i mean we technically i originally weren't really trying to fight the he he popped off there yeah uh it is fascinating how um and i i think it was a major reinhold or harry like a major blow to the psyche of Americans, especially since you're talking about in Vietnam, a generation, the greatest fighting force in American history that won World War II, you mm -hmm. know, and then you have this this blow where you've lost the war and you have these horrible pictures. And I apologize, my screen share is not working, but yeah, I mean, talk about that. Well, well yeah. The, and, and, go ahead. I was going to say, like, and, and then you've had all these, like, these news hosts that are making the Saigon reference, uh, but they're young, just like I myself is. Is like, okay, we didn't experience that on TV. We all had to go back and research and find out what the heck is going on. And then when you said, like, like, so, and that war also the war effort, you also started wondering, like, like how much is like all of this is of just like generals or different like mil officers at the time wanting to do get things different done just before we're just. Uh, to make rank because they know like okay this is my could be my last time to make rank you know this is could be my last appointment is my last thing i need to do this to get rank you know and so they just something just got like like pulled up and pulled on and like dragged on for longer times but like yeah. yeah but the whole like yeah getting ready for the show like yeah it it it, it i think it was like what i figured what you posted when we were talking about we we're doing like secretary more the exact day but i kept hearing it on the radio and you go like okay i'm way too young let me look this up and i'm like oh man this is no, they're wrong. <laughs> this is not even close. <laughs> it's is... not even. It's not close. I mean, Bruce, you they had booklets, right? But the imagery in your head is just is that elevator is exactly is the, the, is the stair seat. That's all you have is that imagery when you're young. It's like yeah, it's I'm gonna I'm gonna pop out to restart my uh, browser so I can show you guys this. The I got, I got a new I reset my computer so it's all messed up. But yeah, I mean the imagery is the only close thing. But Bruce, talk about the the booklets that they had and the Bing Crosby and like. That that shows you they had a printer print things and pass it out. There were code words. That's how prepared they were for this stuff. Right. They they had um a, they had a safe booklet which was went to the people that they were designated that they could go. And these were usually people with some involvement in the South Vietnamese government. Although I presume there were some people that were simply connected to American business and things like that went on. A little bit of speculation, but let's just say the upper middle class in a lot of cases and people who worked for the U.S. government or helped the U.S. government who, you know, both we owed something to and also would be targeted. They got a booklet. It said there were 13 locations throughout Saigon. So when you see that image of the helicopter that you most commonly see, that's not the embassy. If it's the bigger helicopter, it is. If it's the little Huey, that's not the last flight out of a Saigon. It just shows you that now we love these videos then they love these. Uh, then they love the these uh, still images, and you and you still see the effect of an image like that. And it's um, you know, I don't know all the planning that went on during this one. It is true that even with the planning in Saigon, a lot of people found out that hey, we're going to play Bing Crosby. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas, and that means get the heck out of Saigon and get on those copters and get out to the people that need to know that. And there were some like um, Japanese uh, officials and South Korean officials that were in South Vietnam that uh, didn't get out 
timely because they didn't know that music and didn't get the signal and things all mm. all those kind of things went on but what i'm saying we still got a heck of a lot of people out in saigon and, it's, and the marines on the ground do never considered that a failure president ford didn't consider it a failure uh he did authorize that um the hard stop at 345 and no more even if there were people waiting that we had to get our marines out and he did have to well, end was that. that because they were they had to stop because the troops from the Correct. offensive from the North Vietnamese were just what getting you, so close. They didn't want to get involved on a firefight. Yeah. And what the way that it's interesting, which is also a little similar to it, very similar to Kabul, the way that the Marines uh, described it, some of them, is that they let us out. It, 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 like what they were doing was, you're going to give you enough ground fire. We're going to make it clear we're doing this. And the actions at the airport, for instance, are a sign like, we're coming in. You can't stay here any longer, United States. You need to get out. But they did not want an open firefight between um, North Vietnam and the United States in the streets of Saigon at that particular moment when offensive um, actions had stopped in 73. But it was a kind of like, how gentle can a guerrilla army be, right? It, you're not, it's not gentle. They're going to start firing on the ground and letting you know we're moving in. Tanks started arriving. Um, we're not going to let you stay any longer. We're putting the pressure on. And that was coming. Um, they could have done more at the airport, for instance. They did end up killing two Marines that day. A, a lot of the Marines on the ground said they could have done a lot more if they had wanted to. But they, what they were just doing was enough to say, get the heck out. We're coming in. And uh, everything's going to, you know, similar thing, too. Everything's going to be great, too. We're going to be reunited as a country. Why do you want to separate us? So and, what, what ended up happening to, I mean, were the, was there a humanitarian crisis? Were there slaughters? Like, what what happened when they took over the country? Uh, there was a lot of that. I, I don't have as good detail on it, but it was, it was um, I know that many of the people that were South Vietnam, if they could identify them as a particular government agent, you know, there there were many that were killed or put into prison camps. I mean, those people that were escaping had a right to be. One of the things that South Vietnam soldiers were doing was disrobing. Just just they were running around the streets naked because they just took their uniforms off. Because if they were caught with a uniform, I think they know what would have happened. But North Vietnam um, did become a country. I think it was a country that had a lot of economic problems until the point that they could established trade with the United States again in the 90s. So it wasn't a successful country or great country to to be in. I mean, I don't say that out of like, I know there's patriotic pride and things like that or love for a country or the great culture and food and things. But economically, it wasn't, a, even, if, even if you didn't have a political problem or weren't in a jail, you know, you had problems living there. Um, and, yeah, uh, one, of, yeah, one of the interesting things, you know, like, People go back to famously John McCain goes back to his POW camp or you know, people go back to my grandpa was in Okinawa. He never wanted to visit again, uh, but people wanted to go. I mm. just can't imagine that people are going to want to go back to outpost Keating to to like <laughs> resolve something. You know, there's just something about this war that is so fruitless and and uh, that, that people I mean, are soldiers, soldiers. I think uh, Bagram, for instance, when I heard that was captured, I know that's uh a very emotional point for a lot of them because that's where they served and that's where the base mm -hmm. was. Incidentally, it was also for the Soviets. So you get that whole, that was their air base and then it became ours. And I did a whole podcast in the Soviet war in Afghanistan, which is a whole another story that could have had the same exact lesson about um, how long you stay uh, in a war. Like you had referenced earlier, you know, the main thing is to get those casualties to zero. That's what America wants. Peace, prosperity. They're connected. I believe they're connected. You did talk about, I think, when I was uh, when I got zapped off by the vicissitudes of the Internet, uh, uh, you know, um, you were talking a bit about like, yeah, there's like soldiers and generals maybe that kind of in the system and they want to just kind of get the rank like a war creates all of these perpetual forces. And that has to be watched. And so the the part that I really have a good feeling about uh, Biden's decision is that he made it and that he's doubled down on it. He's as he's as doubled down on his decision as Trump was on anything he ever did during his presidency. You know, he's doing that. 
But yeah, I think you're going to look at with a fine tooth comb now all of the planning and what happened and didn't happen and could it have done been done better and all of those things. And those are going to be issues in the midterms in 2022. But the decision to go, the question you have to ask is, do we want another 20 years? You know, in Vietnam, those same pressures were applied. The the sentimentality of soldiers having fought for a cause and, you know, um, their lives, the lives of their friends and their own work and risk in vain is a strong and compelling argument in politics. You will see candidates running um, probably in the GOP in this case on that particular issue. The, the compilation of we we have allies that stood up for the United States and we are not standing by them anymore. These are strong and powerful voices, forces. They always have been. They were in South Vietnam. Ford thinks it was a great disgrace, President Ford, that he was not able to help South Vietnam more. Um, these are these are powerful forces, but the Congress at that time, and I guess you know Trump and Biden now made the call to make the decision they did. Trump might move away from it or not embrace it as much anymore now that he's not president, but the reality is he took those steps and made that call. Otherwise, you could have done it another 20 years. Easy. Yeah. Easy. Those forces are enough. We say, well, we got to stay in because we have to, we have friends here we have to support. Well, with that, we're going to leave it there. It was a great conversation. It was great having you on the program today. Please make sure that you go check out My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. Uh, what 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 are you working on now? What are you uh, going to have in the next few episodes? The 1890s. Uh, it's going to be the Mauve decade, uh, probably a two or three parter on the 1890s. And what a decade of conflict, strife, and also some great literature. All right. Well. My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. Check it out in any podcast app. Harry, Reinhold, thanks for being here. Bruce Carlson, thanks for being here. And listener, thank you for being here. We will see you again on Monday.